Welcome to our daily devotion. The Methodist Church of Barbados invites you to sing, pray, and worship with us as we declare God's glory and celebrate His mighty acts. Gracious and almighty God, how we thank and praise you for the everlasting life that you have given to us by your wonderful grace and love. May we grow day by day to be more like you, full of compassion, kindness and love. Saturate our heart with your love so that we may love you more with every passing breath. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who is making us to be more like you, Lord Jesus. We want to reflect your grace and your beauty in our thoughts, our words and deeds. We ask that we may devote our time and heart to reflect on all who you are and all you have done for us so that you are magnified more and more in our lives so that the beauty of our Lord Jesus may be seen, reflect in us. Father, help us to mature as individuals, as families, as a country, and as your own church. Help us to bring our emotions under the control of your Holy Spirit. Help us to check on our loud talk, our insistence on having things, done in our own ways, our fears, our doubt, and other things which stand as evidence of our immaturity. We do commit ourselves anew and afresh to you. Help your people to be glory and not a shame as we profess your name. Heavenly Father, we are called to abide in Christ, to rest in his love, to remain connected with the Lord Jesus and to depend upon him in all things, knowing that he alone is the true and living vine, so that our lives may bear much fruit and glorify our Father in heaven. We pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, 
we may remain firmly connected to Christ and willingly submitted to your perfect throne in life so that any part in us that is not of Christ may be trimmed away so that we your people may be enabled to grow in grace and mature in our Christian work root out any bad attitudes foolish thoughts or wrong motive that may start to formulate in our mind and which may hinder our good or infect our spiritual life help us we pray to take every thought captive to Christ so that we may become fruitful branches and bear much fruit to the glory of God the Father Heavenly Father you have called us to grow in grace to increase our understanding of Jesus and to develop a close and intimate relationship with you. Lord, this is what we desire to do. And we pray we may come to know you more and more each day. Thank you, Father, for the Bible which is written to help us understand your word of truth. And thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit who has promised to guide us in the way that we should go. We pray that we may learn to walk in spirit and truth so that we may mature in our Christian faith as we spend time in our devotions. Thank you, Father, that you have guided us through our lives and blessed us with various spiritual mentors. Thank you for the men and women you have used throughout our Christian life to teach and encourage us and to share their godly wisdom as well as their gentle correction. Give us an understanding heart and a teachable spirit so that we may take to heart the spiritual lessons that you will have us learn. And may we be used by you to fulfill the good works that you have prepared for us to do. Thank you for calling us your own even when we never deserve to be. Thank you for your grace despite our shortcomings. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who is making us become more like you. We praise you, Lord, for you are worthy of our praise. We bring all our supplications with a grateful heart through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
the Old Testament reading from Exodus 17, verse 8 to 16. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some men for us and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him, and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, and whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side, and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the sun set, and Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a reminder in a book, and recite it in the hearing of Joshua. I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar, and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, A hand upon the banner of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I once heard a story of a boxer who was being beaten in the ring by his opponent. 
punch after punch by his adversary, finally left him with a bruised face, bloody nose, swollen eyes, and much, much pain. The battered boxer's trainer, trying to encourage him between rungs, kept telling him, you're doing a fantastic job. You're doing great. Your opponent is barely touching you. To which the boxer responded, then you better keep your eye on that referee because somebody is killing me in that ring. You see, no matter the amount of smooth talk, it could not camouflage the reality of the battle in which this fighter was engaged. Personal encouragement could not mask the pain he was experiencing as a result of the battle that he found himself in. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, we are all engaged in a real battle against the kingdom of darkness, against a cosmic enemy. To that end, we are facing a real opponent because this world bears the painful scars of this conflict reflected in so many ways, including wars and rumors of wars among nations, tribes, political ideologies. We also see scars as reflected in shattered lives, broken homes, violence in our society, suicide, rape, abuse, and immorality of every kind and proportion. So my brothers and sisters, prayer is not preparation for this battle. I submit to you that prayer is itself the battle. And this is why the enemy will first try to take away the prayer life of every Christian man or woman whose life he wants to destroy. When the enemy is ready to destroy a nation, he tries to silence the prayers of the righteous. Notice that whenever a church is under attack, the enemy goes after the prayer warriors and the intercessors first and tries to take them out, knowing that in doing so that he has taken out the defense system in the life of the church. Once that prayer life of that individual or that church is destroyed, all other things are easy for the enemy. If you notice that whenever your prayer life is going down, whenever you are losing a grip on the discipline of prayer, know that the Holy Spirit is sounding an alarm indicating that there is a renewed battle against your life, against who you are and what is important to you. And therefore, you must stand up and start fighting. We need to take up the spiritual weapon of prayer. It is the weapon that God has given to us individually and to the church to combat the wiles of the enemy. It is the weapon that God has given to us, to the church, to fight so as to overcome. In our passage for tonight... There was a battle between the Amalekites and the Israelites. The physical battle was going on down in the valley. But there was also a spiritual battle 
that was taking place on the mountain, on the hill. You see, Moses knew that before you can get anything to work in the physical, it must first work in the spiritual. So he fought spiritually. Let us examine for a moment the passage that is before us. First, the battle that the Israelites engaged in after the exodus from slavery in Egypt. There are some very intriguing firsts in this battle. Joshua shows up in the biblical narrative first in this particular passage. There is no introduction. He just shows up in the narrative as the one Moses entrusts to be in charge of the military. Her also shows up for the very first time in our passage, accompanying Moses at the top of the hill. The instructions he gives are interesting. Joshua is to choose men capable of fighting. Remember this, these are former slaves with no military training. They have been attacked and Moses says, tomorrow, tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. This would be a hint. The staff of God in my hand? The staff that brought water from the rock? The staff that God used to bring devastation to Egypt was once again going to be lifted up. Moses stretched out the staff and the Red Sea opened up. He stretched out the staff again and God crushed the enemies. And Moses says, tomorrow, tomorrow, the staff of God will be lifted up. Something big is about to happen. This is a signal that God is at it again. That God is going to do something magnificent. But there is a very significant difference between this battle and the defeat of the Egyptian army just three chapters earlier. Here the Israelites fight. Back in chapter 14 of Exodus. When we look at verse 13, and Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. You see, my brothers and sisters, in the battle at the Red Sea, only the Lord was fighting. The people were explicitly instructed not to do anything. They were to stand still and observe the salvation that God would work for them. There they were slaves. And God, God, the God, the God to whom they cried out was fighting the battle for their freedom against their old slave master, Pharaoh. Now they are free. Their slave master is dead. And they have a new battle to fight. And this time they are expected to fight Yes, this time they are expected to be engaged in the fight. This time they're expected to participate. This time they're expected to join in. Even though the Israelites were no longer slaves in Egypt, their troubles were not yet over. They are again being called 
to fight. The Israelites are no match for the Amalekites. The only time they enjoyed any success is when Moses raises his hands with the staff of the Lord towards heaven. The focal point of the story that is before us tonight is not what is happening in the field of battle. It is not what's happening in the valley. The focus of our story is what's happening on the hill. And even on the hill, the picture we have is a picture of weakness, the weakness of Moses. Moses can't even hold his own hands up by himself. He has to sit on a rock and have assistance from two helpers. As Proverb tells us in 21 verse 31, the horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. The victory belongs to the Lord. We have our part to play, but the decisive element is not our strength, it's not our skills, it's not our abilities, it's not our determination. The decisive element is the Lord. The Lord is fighting this battle. The difference between the battles is that in the first, God is fighting for God's people. In this one, in our passage, God is fighting in and through God's people. In the first, God is securing their freedom and he does not need their assistance. In fact, he will not allow them to do anything. He fights exclusively by himself. In this, the battle, in this battle, having already been set free, they are required to fight, but not in their own strength, but in the strength that comes from God. I hear the psalmist saying in 51 verse 17, Oh, my strength, I will sing praises. To you, for you, O oh God, are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. Over and over and over and over again in the scriptures, God is praised by God's people for being their strength and their salvation. God says in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 5, Thus says the Lord God Almighty, Cursed is a man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Do you see how this relates to our battle? God has fought for us and won the victory all by God's self. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift from God, not as a result of works, so that anyone may boast, for we are his workmanship. Jesus decisively won the victory on the cross without any help from us. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, according to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. Anything, therefore, we offer in the way of help or Payment for that battle is nothing but an insult and brings us under the curse. But if we think that now that we are free, the Christian life will be trouble-free, we have a harsh reality to face, we are in a fight, my brothers and sisters, we fight against principalities and powers. Paul charges us to fight the good fight of faith. We have a 
cruel enemy who will stop at nothing until you are destroyed. He doesn't play fair. Paul describes our battle as a serious call to arms in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. And I hear the Apostle Paul saying, Finally, my brothers and sisters, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes, the wiles of the devil, the enemy. For we do not, we do not, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness, of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up Take up the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand and withstand in the evil day. And having done all, the word of God says, stand firm. You've got to be strong, but not in your own strength. We have to be strong, but not in our own strength. We have to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. You prepare for battle by being strong in the Lord. You will have to stand against the schemes and the wiles of the devil. You are in way over your head if you try to do this in your own strength or in your own power. If ever we try to stand against the rulers and the authorities and the cosmic power over this present darkness, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, in our own strength, we will fail. There's no way that you or anyone can win this battle in your own strength. The enemy is much stronger than you. But I hear the songwriter saying that Jesus is stronger than Satan and sin and Satan to Jesus must bow. Therefore, therefore, I triumph without and within Jesus saves me now. See, you cannot be strong in your own strength. You have to put on the whole armor, but it is God's armor. You wrestle, you withstand, you stand firm, you will be victorious in this battle because Greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. I hear the writer of Colossians chapter 1 saying, For this I toil, struggling with all this energy that he powerfully works within me. Through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. Serve in the strength that God supplies to so that God gets all the glory. It is no longer I that liveth, but it is Christ who liveth in me. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. You see, Moses lifting up his hand signaled and signified a dependence on and trust in Almighty God. His staff represented God's authority and God's strength. By holding it up, Moses was clearly appealing to God for his help in the battle. When he held it up, Israel prevailed. When he let it down, 
The Amalekites prevailed. So it seems to be a picture of prevailing prayer that lays hold on God's strength and God's power. Although Joshua was fighting with the sword, Moses was holding up the staff of God and Joshua's success hinged on Moses' strength to keep his hands lifted up. Many Jewish and Christian scholars agree that the lifting up of hands as a signal or attitude of prayer, the action on the hilltop on the mountain secured the strength needed to obtain victory in the valley beneath from Almighty God, not merely by the elevation of the staff, but by the power of intercessory prayer. Israel was to learn a vital lesson. They could not conquer the ungodly powers of this world by sword alone, but by the power of God coming down on high, obtained through prayer. So the private victory on the hilltop, on the mountain, secured the public victory in the valley. I want someone to hear that again. I want you to hear me and I want you to hear me well that this was a lesson for Israel and Israel discovered that the power of God coming down on high obtained through prayer. So the private victory on the hilltop on the mountain secured the victory in the valley. The private victory in the prayer closet uh, reveals and secures the public victory in the open in the world. The private victory on your knee secures the public victory of a son coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. The private victory in your prayer closet on your knees secures the public victory of you overcoming, of you triumphing, of you doing well. Oh yes, my brothers and sisters, the private prayer time secures public victories. And so sometimes people marvel that you are such a tremendous overcomer and they may not be able to appreciate the hours that you spent in prayer before God. Prayer, as I said earlier, is not preparation for the battle. Prayer is the battle, and that's a quote from E.M., Bonds. Another quote that says, the battle is won or lost in prayer. There's yet another quote that says, prayer is striking the winning blow. Service is gathering up the results. Yet another quote, prayer to our Father in secret and every public thing will be strapped with the presence of God. God shapes the world by prayer. The prayer of God's saints are the capital stock of heaven by which God carries on the great work of God on earth. It is no wonder that the largest church in the world was built on prayer. It is no wonder that ministries that are truly making a difference in the world and bringing people to the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ are supported by prayer. If we look at this story again, we would see that Moses prayed while Joshua fought and he found out that he must keep his hands stretched to heaven in prayer. If he must open the door for God's supernatural intervention, Moses discovered that God's prevailing power is released through prayer and that this power is released into the lives of those who pray and for those for whom we pray. It would be hard for God to release God's power into the life of one who does not take prayer seriously. Prayerless people 
cut themselves off from God's prevailing power. Prayerlessness and prayerless people are overcome, beaten down, pushed down, pushed around and defeated by life and by the enemy. When Moses' strength began to fail, Aaron and her provided the necessary support. But so often the intercessor is left without the support that is needed. While Joshua fought Moses, Aaron and her went to the mountain top and prayed. Aaron and her were with Moses from the beginning when Moses struggled to keep his hands lifted up. Aaron and her provided the support he needed. Aaron and her did not receive word that Moses was struggling and then left the camp and went to look for him on the mountain. They were with him from the very beginning and when they saw him begin to struggle, they went into action. They provided Moses with a place to sit. And they held up his arms. The story tells us that they found a rock and placed it under him so that he could sit. This requires physical effort on the part of Aaron and her. They did not take Moses to the rock. They brought the rock to Moses. And then they stood beside him supporting his arms keeping the staff of God lifted up. Moses did not have to say, Aaron and her, come up here. I am struggling. They went with him. And when they saw him struggling, they provided the help, the support that was necessary without being asked. They did not ask Moses, is there anything we can do for you? They knew what he needed because they were present with him from the beginning. Unfortunately, my brothers and sisters, that is not the reality for most intercessors. As the battle increases with intensity, the intercessor's world grows smaller and their support system grows thin and life moves at a slower pace because of the constant physical, emotional, and spiritual friction created by wanting to see the will of God come to pass in their lives, in the church, and in the world. As the battle rages on, the intercessor grows weary, and without the support system necessary to bear the weight of the church, the intercessor becomes tired and the enemy begins to prevail. So often those with good intentions are focused on the fighting of the battle that Joshua and fail to look to the mountain top. They fail to see the intercessor lifting up his or her arms with the weight of the world, with the weight of the church pressing down. No one was there when the intercessors climbed the hill. No one was there when the battle began. No one was there when the intercessor first raised his or her hand to ensure that the body of Christ the church prevails in this wicked and dark world and oftentimes no one is there to recognize the needs of the intercessors and to provide the rock upon which to sit and the strength by which to support his or her arms. My brothers and sisters, I believe that the Lord is saying to us, that in order for the victory to be won, there is a need for the church to spend more time focusing on the ministry of intercession. If the church is going to overcome in this very dark and difficult age, the church must pay more attention to the ministry of intercessors and intercession. Because you see, in the end, the message of this story is clear. Even Joshua needs a Moses, and every Moses needs an Aaron and an her. I can testify that in my own life and ministry, 
The Lord has been very good to me. At every stage, the Lord has assigned an intercessor to support me in this ministry. And so whatever I have done in this ministry that is worth celebrating, I give thanks to God for the men and women whom God has brought alongside me, who have supported my efforts and supported me and supported the church in prayer. I bless God for the ways in which God may have used me to hold up the hand of someone or be that intercessor on that person's behalf. You see, my brothers and sisters, we are the family of God, the body of Christ. And there are times when God is going to send us into the valley to fight physically. There are other times when the Lord is going to send us to the mountain to fight spiritually. But both roles are important, both the one in the valley and the one on the mountain is participating in the battle. And so that's why I said that every Joshua needs a Moses and every Moses needs an Aaron and a Hur. If you know a Moses, then you need to choose. Are you going to be an Aaron and a Hur? Or are you going to be the agent of Satan, a Malachite? Because when you fail to help lift up the arms of an intercessor, you are figuratively contributing to the battle. It is my prayer that God will raise up intercessors all over the church and all over the Caribbean and all over the world for the battle is the Lord's. Amen. Yeah.
Brothers and sisters, do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For those who fight against us, whom we see today and shall never see again, the Lord will fight for you, and you only have to keep still. Let us go forth into the world in peace, dedicated to the service of God. Let us hold fast to that which is good, render to no person evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weary, encourage the tired, honor all people. Let us love and serve, and may God's blessing be upon us and remain with us always. Amen. Thank you for being a part of our daily devotion. We trust it has been a blessing to you. Now together, let us hold fast to his word and may it dwell in all of us richly.